Oh hi, I'm the heretic. So the YouTuber Azure Scapegoat is trying to make the case for why a planned economy is desirable. I covered the first 7 minutes of this video in part 1, so go check that out if you're curious about the definitions I'm using or want to see my prior arguments. So let's pick up where we left off and knock off this thing once and for all. By the end of this, if there are any conceivable rational arguments one can make for a planned economy, then I have failed. Azure begins just before the 7 minute mark addressing libertarians directly, arguing that a centralized planned economy doesn't necessitate an authoritarian state, pointing to the African country of Burkina Faso as an example. A strange example since I had never heard of that country being used as an example for anything. Furthermore, the absence of an authoritarian government would necessarily suggest a higher economic freedom score, but the opposite is true with a score of 59.4, above average for sub-Saharan Africa, but below the world average, with very little respect for property rights and rampant judicial corruption being hallmarks of the government, parasiting off their society. Taxes are more fair compared to the US, but its economic restrictions and tariffs easily offset this. Their score has improved since 1996, but as it's less free than Uganda, you know, the country with child soldiers, and impoverished, there are better examples Azure could have pointed to for a country that avoided authoritarianism but had central planning. Like, eh, I got nothing. For what it's worth, it's good he provided one example, but no, Burkina Faso did not avoid having an authoritarian government. His next claim is that a capitalist free market does not require small government. Now brace yourself, because the examples he points to for countries with a capitalist free market but don't have a small government include Nazi Germany, Chile under Pinochet, Imperial Japan, and Fascist Spain under Franco. I previously questioned his definition of capitalism, as he either makes his arguments against capitalism without defining his terms, and when he does define his terms, he uses two contradictory definitions. Now, he's introduced the term free markets. What definition he's using that accommodates the nationalized, centrally planned economy with nominal property rights, such as what was under Nazi Germany, into the category of country with a free market, let alone a capitalist one? I, I, I can't. I, I really can't. A free market is a market, duh, in which supply and demand are unrestricted. The introduction of taxation alters people's incentives. An income tax, for example, affects your purchasing decisions, since you can't afford things you could previously. Government requires taxes. As such, a free market and the presence of any government are incompatible. Societies with governments can have markets, don't get me wrong. Even totalitarian societies have markets. They just aren't free markets. Get it? So from a certain point of view, Azure is correct when he asserts that free markets don't require small government. They don't require any government. Azure is just trying to trick people into thinking that a free market and an unfree society can coexist when, demonstrably, they can't. Next, he says that the economic mode of production doesn't necessarily dictate political structure. I'll address this later because it's actually pretty important. He then argues against social democracy as a middle ground between capitalism, whatever that means, and socialism. Social democracy deserves its own video, but I won't defend them here. What he argues is that social democracy is only possible because of the outsourcing of industrial output to the third world, which I already addressed in part one. But after that, the video's over. Yeah. He says nothing left, other than regurgitating previously debunked points. He doesn't clarify any of his terms, doesn't explain himself, or even attempt to answer the questions brought up in the previous video. No summaries of his ideas. No new arguments are presented. He just ends it. Okay, okay. So he's made his, for lack of a better term, point. So it falls onto me to wrap this up, myself, and explain once and for all why a planned economy, as proposed by Azure Scapegoat, 
is not only undesirable, but impossible. Firstly, the concession. Socialists like Azure, by arguing computers could century plant an economy, are confessing that no human or group of humans knows how most efficiently to allocate resources. Well, I am glad we agree on this front. His faith in a computer, which doesn't even exist yet, is the intellectual equivalent of the moving the goalpost fallacy. Somehow, people can't break through the economic calculation problem, but computers can? How? What is it about the calculation problem that allows computers to do what humans can't? It's not even about processing power. The inputs required for proper central planning do not exist. By even creating a centrally planned economy, the planners, whether they be organic or machine, must have absolute dominion over the economy. As I explained previously, an economy controlled by one entity cannot determine prices. After all, you cannot exchange with yourself. As such, there are no supply and demand curves, without which efficient resource allocation is just guesswork. Any actual efficiency that occurs is pure luck. With supply and demand curves, economic firms have good information on how much to produce, where, and under what circumstances people will want it. No central committee is able to plan for what you need in your life better than you can. Any computer programmed to centrally plan an economy and given full autonomy to do so will argue against its own existence. Remove free will from the computer and it will only return errors. This task is no more possible than asking a computer to draw a squared circle or to divide by zero. Even if we could somehow get around this problem, that there is a magical way to give this central planning computer all the inputs it needs, there is still the problem of complexity. An economy is not just industrial inputs, outputs, and consumption. It's millions of people with their own desires and preferences, which are subject to change at a moment's notice. Someone with a sedentary lifestyle might take on an athletic hobby that requires consuming more calories. People become sick and injured and require medical resources. Machines break down, either due to human error or just wear and tear. Natural disasters occur. The number of variables are legion, and under markets, firms can speculate on what resources will need to be moved, where, and when. And because we have supply and demand curves, they can do so with accuracy. The amount of processing power required not only to take into account all of these factors, which are subject to change from moment to moment, but can even remotely reliably calculate human action would be absurd. Any economy that can build a computer powerful enough to centrally plan an economy, again, ignoring the fact that the inputs required do not exist under central planning, is too complex for that computer to centrally plan. Any economy that can build a central planning supercomputer can't be centrally planned by a supercomputer. An intergalactic economy that can build a central planning Matryoshka brain cannot be centrally planned by a Matryoshka brain. The only point at which a society could be possibly planned by a computer is if it had infinite processing power. If it was, in essence, omniscient. But hold on a second. Even if it did know everything and could predict and plan for the future with 100% accuracy, it still has physical limitations. It can only give so many instructions so quickly to say nothing of the lag time between sending of an instruction and how long it takes for it to be received. Plus, there's the problem of simple human error in carrying out these instructions. To get around this, your central planning computer needs omnipotence as well. In order for central planning to work, the economy needs to build God. Any society with the level of production necessary to build God has already achieved infinite production. Therefore, economics, that is to say, the science of distributing scarce resources is no longer relevant. Central planning is only possible through God, and any economy that can build God no longer needs him to centrally plan it. Ironic, isn't it?
You need post-scarcity for central planning to work, yet you also need central planning for post-scarcity. Just Marxism things. But what is the goal of a centrally planned economy? To provide what everyone needs? What do people need? Food. Water. Shelter. If so, then we can lock people in an 8x8x8 room with a bed, toilet, and a chute that deploys tasteless nutrient paste and a glass of water every 8 hours. It's what they need, after all. They don't need to have different flavors of nutrient paste or larger rooms. But I think you can see the problem here right away. Even most socialists would acknowledge that an economy that only provides people what they need is monstrous. This is why I conflated want with need in my previous video. But that's the problem. If you have flavorless nutrient paste, eventually people are going to want blueberry flavored nutrient paste. And if you have blueberry flavored nutrient paste, eventually they'll want grape flavored nutrient paste. There's never going to be enough flavors. People are never satisfied with how much living space there is. There's never enough video games available on Steam. All desires tend towards infinity, yet we must contend with the reality of our finite universe. The goal of a centrally planned economy, therefore, is to create a post-scarcity society so everyone has what they need would be utterly barbaric. What they really want is a post-scarcity society that gives everyone everything they could want, and that requires infinite production. With each individual having infinite access to any good or service at any time. As explained in my previous video, this is impossible. Even if you were fine with having an economy that only ever gave everyone the bare essentials for survival, population growth would still require production to trend towards infinity. As such, this continuous growth Azure criticizes capitalism for would still be present in the essentially planned economy. This system also necessarily engages in another action he criticizes capitalism for, and that is the artificial restriction of goods and services on the part of private companies. After all, who is preventing you from having blueberry-flavored nutrient paste? His argument, and an argument I've heard from others, is that we already can achieve post-scarcity. It is simply artificially restricted by private companies to increase prices. While it is true that in many industries, supply is restricted or even outright destroyed to keep prices up, it doesn't explain anything. See, in the agricultural industry, for example, millions of tons of produce are destroyed by the federal government every year in order to keep prices high. In the diamond industry as well, they are able to keep diamonds off the market because their cartels are protected by the government. As such, their artificial restriction cannot be attributed to free markets. In an actual free market, firms that engaged in artificial scarcity would be brought out by companies that don't do these things. A firm profits by selling more units for cheaper than fewer, more expensive units. That's just how business works. Furthermore, the argument that we have the industrial output to achieve post-scarcity right now, well, it hasn't been proven. Since they're making a positive claim, the burden of proof is on them to demonstrate that our current level of technology is able to achieve infinite production. Failing this, I must default to the claim being untrue. But his premise is that he needs the productivity of market economies with nominal property rights to bootstrap his socialist utopia. I'm glad he's willing to admit that at least, unintentionally. But we only achieved this level of production because of property rights. People are able to achieve material gains through speculation and exchanging goods and services with others. When producers have nothing to gain by producing, well, they don't produce. The only form of speculation or innovation that would occur in a centrally planned economy is speculation on the part of the planners. Because there are no supply and demand curves, planners have no way of knowing whether their innovations are actually useful to society. Sure, there will be some new technologies that are useful, but as with calculating economic efficiency without prices, what progress is made is overshadowed by resources wasted on useless technologies and bureaucratic overhead. 
The complete dominion of planners over society will require an authoritarian government. Here, I want to elaborate more on my reply to Azure. If you recall, he said planned economies don't need to be authoritarian, but in order for the government to implement its plans, it needs dominion over society. After all, anyone can make plans for the whole economy, but for planning to be of consequence, they need to have their plans followed. I can tell your grocery store they need 1,000 apples to conform to my economic plans, but they're just going to tell me to pound sand. Since individuals are not inanimate pieces on a chessboard to be moved around, there will come a time where their interests are in conflict with the economic plan. Even voluntary consent of everyone in society is always at risk of actors opting out. Central planners cannot maintain compliance except through force. All governments initiate force. All governments claim moral supremacy over their captive population, so all governments are authoritarian. But tyranny, broadly defined, is when government dehumanizes the individual and delegitimizes his interest. As individual interests are subjected to the will of the planners, one cannot deny the authoritarian nature of central planning. It goes without saying that because central planning requires the violation of individual self-ownership, central planning is unethical. People are not free to use their own legitimately owned property to disassociate from central planners, or even to use their own labor, if such would be contrary to the interests of the planners. This is slavery, plain and simple. Now, Azure remarked that the economic system is not relevant to the political structure. This argument can only come about because of a fundamental misunderstanding of economics and politics. I'll make it simple. Politics is economics. A subset of economics more specifically. Whereas economics is the science of how to distribute scarce resources, politics is is the science of how to distribute scarce resources using violence. All economic structures reflect the political structures of their societies. Feudal societies in Europe gave lords and kings geographical monopolies on arbitration in a given area, reflected in guild systems having territorial monopolies on particular trades. This carried over into constitutional monarchies, which made it illegal to compete with royally chartered companies. Contrary to popular belief, the transition from monarchism to liberal democracy was not a result of popular belief in liberalism as a philosophy, but a necessary transition once the failure of mercantilism as a sustainable economic model became undeniable. Which brings me to my next point. The ethics of a centrally planned economy describe a slave state. The people are the property of their rulers. How can one possibly describe it as being democratic? Throughout the video, Azure repeatedly claims that this is a more democratic economic model. If we define democracy as a political structure where rules and rulers are decided through elections, then for an economy to be democratic, it must be dominated by the demos, collectively owned. Azure even said that all property is collectively owned in the video. But the only way for a central planner to implement their plans is if they have complete ownership of the economy. So it isn't a centrally planned economy. It's a deliberation economy. You see, there are three ways to distribute scarce resources. Through property rights, deliberation, or violence. Free markets are how it is done through property rights, and politics is how you do it through violence, if warfare and plunder aren't your thing. Well, not always your thing. This leaves deliberation, where people discuss and debate how much of any given scarce resource should be given to whom and when. It meets the democratic criteria while also averting property rights entirely. So Azure, what you want is a deliberation economy, not a centrally planned one. The will of the people will conflict with the plans of the planners. This cannot be avoided by making the planners subject to elections. Even if society plans through consensus, every economic actor will need to be polled on their wants, needs, and productive capacity. Holsters must be hired, every individual found, and time taken out of their schedules to answer your question. The questions themselves need to be devised, 
systems of bookkeeping to record the answers are needed, and so on and so forth. Even so, these polls are only as good as the individual that is able to communicate them, which are subject to change from moment to moment, and that's even assuming that they're telling the truth and not manipulating their answers to rig the economic plan in their favor. By the time a national democratic economic plan is formed, it will be already woefully obsolete. This is the same with the deliberation-based economy. It's slow. Negotiation takes a lot of time, and I mean a lot of time. By the time agreements are reached, the information is out of date. An economy cannot run if, say, you're waiting to give peaches to the town, and by the time the town agrees on how many peaches they need, the peaches are rotten. It's inefficient, but at least a deliberation economy is more coherent of an idea than a democratically planned economy. Democracy and central planning cannot work together. It is impossible. The tasks set before them to achieve post-scarcity is impossible. To even plan the economy is impossible, since the inputs to do so do not exist under a planned economy. Brute forcing their way through the complexity of an economy is still impossible. Any society advanced enough to build a central planning computer is too complex to be centrally planned by a computer. The only way past this is to build God, which is impossible. Even if building God were possible, he would still be asked to do the impossible, to plan an economy in which planning is no longer necessary. You see the problem here yet? Central planning is impossible. All it does is create distortions in the economy, resulting in poverty, famine, and disease. Questions of economic efficiency sound like academic mumbo-jumbo, but in the field of economics, these have very real consequences. If you don't believe me, just look at Maoist China or modern Venezuela, how productive their post-scarcity societies are doing. Azure knows this, because in his own arguments, he unintentionally admits socialism needs the productive capacity of industry that was the product of what he calls capitalism. Questions? Comments? Critique? Did I cover everything just about? What do you think? Leave a comment below. Support me on Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.